Hi team, Ms. Vaughn here, here to read you the last little bit of chapter 15 from page 167 until the end. Um, okay, to frame this, remember that we are in the middle of baby Suggs being freed from sweet home and Mr. Garner is driving her to the house that's being given to her by the Bodwins. Um, yeah, if you guys remember from the notes that we put over here on the board, we got the Bodwins, um, Ella and John, they're going to, or no, sorry, not Ella and John. The Baldwins, they are a sister and a brother who give one, two, four to baby Suggs after she's been freed. Um, and then that one, two, four becomes a stop on the Underground Railroad. So keep that in your mind. Um, and that baby Suggs just had this revelation that once she is free, she realizes that she has a heartbeat and that her hands are hers. And there's very much this sense of like ownership over her own body. And it's the first time that she's really ever been able to experience that ownership over her body. And it makes her feel so free that she just kind of like laughs a little bit. Okay, top of page 167. Mr. Garner laugh. nothing to be scared of, Jenny. Just keep your same ways. You'll be all right. She covered her mouth to keep from laughing too loud. These people I'm taking you to will give you what help you need. Name a Bodwin, a brother and a sister, Scots. I've been knowing them for 20 years or more. Baby Suggs thought it was a good time to ask him something she had long wanted to know. Oh yeah. Okay. So I'm rereading this part, but this is the part about um, the names, how baby Suggs didn't have her own name when she was enslaved. She was just named by whatever the slave owner named her or whatever was on her bill of sale when she was sold to someone else. Um, and so Mr. Garner is going to talk this through here and she's going to decide that her name is going to be baby Suggs once she's free. Uh, Mr. Garner, she said, why you all call me Jenny? Because that's what's on your sales ticket, gal. Ain't that your name? What you call yourself? Nothing, she said. I don't call myself nothing. Mr. Garner went red with laughter. When I look at you, when I took you out of Carolina, Whitlow called you Jenny, and Jenny Whitlow is what his bill said. Didn't he call you Jenny? No, sir. If he did, I didn't hear it. What did you answer to? Anything, but Suggs is what my husband named. You got married, Jenny? I didn't know it, manner of speaking. You know where he is, this husband? No, sir. Is that Hallie's daddy? No, sir. Why you call him Suggs then? His bill of sale says Whitlow too, just like yours. Suggs is my name, sir, from my husband. He didn't call me Jenny. What'd he call you? Baby. Well, said Mr. Garner, going pink again. If I was you, I'd stick to Jenny Whitlow. Mrs. Baby Suggs ain't no name for a free person. Maybe not, she thought, but Baby Suggs is all she had left of the husband she claimed. A serious melancholy man who taught her how to make shoes. The two of them made a pact. Whichever one got a chance to run would take it, together if possible, alone if not, and no looking back. He got his chance, and since she never heard otherwise, she believed he made it. Now how could he find or hear tell of her if she was calling herself some bill of sale name? Okay, so she renames herself Baby Suggs because Baby is what he called her. Suggs was his last name. So she's like, if there's any hope of me being able to be reunited with him, I'm going to have to go by a name that's familiar to him. She couldn't get over the city, more people than Carolina and enough white folks to stop the breath. Two-story buildings everywhere and walkways made of perfectly cut slats in the road. Roads wide as Garner's whole house. Okay, there's all these little sneaky details that Toni Morrison um, weaves into her narrative. But when she says here, more people than Carolina and enough white folks to stop the breath, um, remember that Mrs. Garner brings in school teacher and his nephews after Mr. Garner dies because she doesn't want to be the only white person at Sweet Home. So there very much is this idea of apartheid that's rooted in slavery, where white people were not the majority if they had all of the power. Um, and so we see that hinted at here, that there are more people than Carolina and enough white folks to stop the breath. So when Baby Suggs goes from um, Kentucky to Ohio, she's kind of shocked at the number of white people that are in Ohio um, and compared to where she was in Kentucky, where most of the places where she was enslaved, Black people outnumbered white people. This is the city of water, said Mr. Garner. Everything travels by water and what the rivers can't carry, the canals take. A queen of a city, Jenny. Everything you ever dreamed of, they make it right here. Iron stoves, buttons, ships, shirts, hairbrushes, paint, steam engines, books, a sewer system makes your butt, your eyes bug out. Oh, this is a city, all right. If you have to live in a city, this is it. The Baldwins lived right in the center of a street full of houses and trees. 
Mr. Garner left, leapt out and tied his horse to a solid iron post. Here we are. Baby picked up her bundle with great difficulty, caused by her hip and the hours of sitting in a wagon, climbed down. Mr. Garner was up the walk and on the porch before she touched the ground, but she got a peep of a girl's face at the door before she followed a path to the back of the house. She waited what seemed a long time before this same girl opened the kitchen window and offered her a seat by the window. Or sorry, kitchen door and offered her a seat by the window. Can I get you anything to eat, ma'am? The girl asked. No, darling. I'd look favorable on some water, though. The girl went to the sink and pumped a cup full of water. She placed it in Baby Suggs' hand. I'm Janie, ma'am. Baby marveled at the sink, drank every drop of water, although it tasted like a serious medicine. Suggs, she said, blotting her lips with the back of her hand. Baby Suggs. Glad to meet you, Mrs. Suggs. I'm going to be staying. Are you, you going to be staying here? I don't know where I'll be. Mr. Garner, that's him. That's him what brought me here. He says he arranged something for me. And then I'm free, you know? Janie smiled. Yes, ma'am. Your people live around here? Yes, ma'am. All of us out on Bluestone. We scattered, said Baby Suggs, but maybe not for long. Great God, she thought. Where do I start? Get somebody to write old Whitlow? See who took Patty and Rosalie? Somebody named Dunn got Ardelia and went west, she heard. No point in trying for Tyree or John. They cut 30 years ago, and if she searched too hard and they were hiding, fighting them would do them more harm than good. Nancy and Famous died in a ship off Virginia coast before it set sail for Savannah. That much she knew. The overseer at Whitlow's place brought her the news, more from a wish to have his way with her than from the kindness of his heart. The captain waited three weeks in port to get a full cargo before setting off. Of the slaves in the hold who didn't make it, he said, there are two Whitlows, name of, but she knew their names, she knew, and covered her ears with her fists to keep from hearing them come from his mouth. Jenny heated some milk and poured it in a bowl next to a plate of cornbread. cornbread. After some coaxing, baby Suggs came to the table and sat down. She crumbled the bread into the hot milk and discovered she was hungrier than she had ever been in her life, and that was saying something. They going to miss this? No, said Janie. Eat all you want. It's ours. Anybody else live here? Just me, Mr. Woodruff. He does the outside chores. He comes by two, three days a week. Just you two? Yes, ma'am. I do the cooking and the washing. Maybe your people know of somebody looking for help. I'd be sure to ask, but I know they take women at the slaughterhouse. Doing what? I don't know. Something the men don't want to do, I reckon. My cousins say you get all the meat you want, plus 25 cents the hour. She makes summer sausage. Baby Suggs lifted her hand to the top of her head. Money? Money? They would pay her money every single day? Money? Where is this here slaughterhouse, she asked. Before Jamie, or Janie excuse me, could answer, the Bodwins came into the kitchen with a grinning Mr. Garner behind. Undeniably brother and sister, both dressed in gray with faces too young for their snow white hair. Did you give her anything to eat, Janie? asked the brother. Yes, sir. Keep your seat, Janie, said the sister. And that good news got better. When they asked what work she could do, instead of reeling off the hundreds of tasks she had performed, she asked about the slaughterhouse. She was too old for that, they said. She's the best cobbler you ever see, said Mr. Garner. Cobbler? Sister Baldwin raised her black, thick eyebrows. Who taught you that? Was a slave taught me, said Baby Suggs. New boots or just repair? New, old, anything. Oh yeah, to clarify, cobblers, they make shoes. So Baby Suggs makes shoes. Well, said Brother Bodwin, that'll be something, but you'll need more. What about taking and wash, Sister asked Sister Bodwin. Yes, ma'am. Two cents a pound. Yes, ma'am. But where's the inn? What? You said taking and wash. Where's the inn? Where am I going to be? Oh, just listen to this, Jenny, said Mr. Garner. These two angels got a house for you, a place they own out of ways. It had belonged to their grandparents before they moved in town. Recently, it had been rented out to a whole parcel of people who had left the state. It was too big a house for Jenny alone. They said two rooms upstairs, two down, but it was the best and only thing that they could do. In return for laundry, some seamstress work, a little canning and so on. Oh, shoes too. They would prevent her to stay there, provided she was clean. The past parcel of colored wasn't. Baby Suggs agreed to the situation, sorry to see the money go, but excited about a house with steps. Never mind she couldn't climb them. Mr. Garner told the Bodwins that she was a right fine cook as well as a fine cobbler and showed his belly and the sample on his feet. Everybody laughed. Anything you need, let us know, said the sister. We don't hold with slavery, even Garner's kind. Tell him, Jenny, you live any you live any better on any place before mine? No, sir, she said, no place. How long was you at Sweet Home? Ten year, I believe. Ever go hungry? No, sir. Cold? No, sir. Anybody lay a hand on you? No, sir. 
Did I let Hallie buy you or not? Yes, sir, you did, she said, thinking, but you got my boy and I'm all broke down. You'd be renting him out to pay for me way after I'm gone to glory. Um, so Mr. Garner is trying to make himself feel kind of noble in this situation by having Baby Suggs talk about Sweet Home as the best place that she's ever been. But in the back of Baby Suggs' mind, she's also like, you're not as great as you think you are because instead of just letting me be free when my hip went out, you are making my son have to work until um, probably way after I'm going to be dead and gone. Woodruff, said, Woodruff, they said, would carry her out there. They said, and all three disappeared through the kitchen door. I have to fix the supper now, said Janie. I'll help, said Baby Suggs. You're too short to reach the fire. It was dark when Woodruff clicked the horse into a trot. He was a young man with a heavy beard and a burned place on his jaw the beard did not hide. You born up here, Baby Suggs asked him. No, ma'am, Virginia. Been here a couple of years. I see. You going to a nice house? Big two. Are you going to a nice house? Statement. Big two. A preacher and his family was in there, 18 children. Have mercy where they go. Took off to Illinois. Bishop Allen gave him a congregation up there. Big. What church is around here? I ain't set foot in one in 10 years. How come? Wasn't none. I disliked the place I was before, this last one. But I did get to church every Sunday, some kind of way. I bet the Lord done forgot who I am by now. Go see Reverend Pike, ma'am. He'll reacquaint you. I won't need him for that. I can make my own acquaintance. What I need him for is to reacquaint me with my children. He can read and write, I reckon? Sure. Good, because I got, I got a lot of digging up to do. But the news they dug up was so pitiful, she quit. After two years of messages written by the preacher's hand, two years of washing, sewing, canning, cobbling, cobbling, gardening, and sitting in churches, all she found out was that the Whitlow place, Whitlow place was gone and that you couldn't write to, quote, a man named Dunn, end quote, if all you knew was that he went west. The good news, however, was that Hallie got married and had a baby coming. She fixed on that and had her own brand of preaching, having made up her mind about what to do with the heart that started beating the minute she crossed the Ohio River. And it worked out, worked out just fine, until she got proud and let herself be overwhelmed by the sight of her daughter-in-law and Hallie's children, one of whom was born on the way, and have a celebration of blackberries that put Christmas to shame. Now she stood in the garden, smelling disapproval, feeling a dark and coming thing, and seeing high top shoes that she didn't like the look of at all, at all. Okay, um, we know that Seth is not the only one who has to deal with her past. We know that Paul D is not the only one who has to deal with his past. We know that Denver is not the only one who has to deal with her past. Um, we see the painfulness of baby sucks here, having to, or wanting to figure out her past, but she doesn't have the people there to answer the questions that she has to ask. Um, and so she decides to rebuild herself, but in that rebuilding, she draws all of this attention to herself. That attention creates some jealousy, and we're going to see the end results of that jealousy from the community in chapter 16. All right, bye-bye.